This is um, All Saints Day. It's also Commitment Sunday, which means that we gear our stewardship campaign around this weekend as we look forward to 2023 and plan to resource our ministries as a congregation. So this morning, I do want you thinking along with me about our theme for this season, which is that God has called all of us to a more common good. Growing as a congregation and growing personally in our faith will always be a movement into sharing and togetherness, a shift towards collaboration and friendship. So with that in mind, will you listen now for God's word to you as we read from scripture? This comes from 1 Peter 2 verses 1 through 5. Therefore, get rid of all ill will and all deceit, pretense, envy, and slander. That's enough right there, huh? <laughs> Instead, like a newborn baby, desire the pure milk of the word. Nourished by it, you will grow into salvation, since you have tasted that the Lord is good. Shift of image here. Now you are coming to him as to a living stone, even though this stone was rejected by humans, from God's perspective it is chosen, valuable, and you yourselves are being built like living stones into a spiritual temple. This is the word of the Lord. Jenna, you can put that next uh, slide up. Um, our young people, the fourth, fifth, sixth graders, stay in with us on communion Sundays. On other weeks, they go to their own uh, worship experience, but they stay in here with us. So they have a, a kind of a sheet that they're following along with. So I won't point every slide out to you, fourth, fifth, and sixth graders. I think you can keep track, but this is your first one. The point of these two images from our scripture reading is... This is a fill in the blank if you're a youngster, that we need each other. Growing in God's grace means, always means growing closer to other people. Maybe some of these easy fill in the blank things are good not just for our young people, but for some of us who are adults too. Maybe this is just good learning. Today's uh, sermon is part of a, a larger series of sermons uh, during the fall that we've entitled A New Way Forward Faith for Here and Now. During this sermon series, we've been trying to raise provocative questions about the shape of our lives. God's Spirit calls us to stay awake, to stay open rather than closed, rather than calcifying into rigid rhythms or fixating on what feels familiar. We're doing our best to stay flexible as we pay attention to all the different ways that the living Christ is enticing us, luring us into unexpected life-giving paths. Our culture, our economy, our educational system, our media streams, all of these channels, they do challenge us to grow. This doesn't just happen in church. There, so there isn't anything particularly Christian or particularly faithful about growth, growing per se. But taking a clue from our scripture reading today, the Christian tradition invites us into growth that happens in the context of a common life. It's not just self-help hemmed in by the assumptions of individualism and independence. This new way forward that we're all seeking together, this new way forward is always mutuality, collaboration, partnership, friendship, and interdependence. If that word isn't in your lexicon, I invite you to take it with you. It may be the only thing you need to take with you today, but put it in your pocket and go interdependence. We're here together because the church is an experiment in a collaborative way of life. So let me draw your attention back to the card that you have and that question about how you might use your gifts in the coming year. The real question that I want you thinking about is how might your life, your experience, your passion, your gifts, your capacities and skill sets, your resources, how might all of that be deployed as common wealth? instead of private wealth. We'll ask you to bring your card as an offering to God because we want to ritualize and acknowledge the risk, the real risk that accompanies this act of faith. It feels risky, it feels vulnerable to offer our lives as a gift for God, to really 
put it out there and say, I have this and I have this to give. By the way, just a note, your car doesn't have to have anything new or profound on it. As I look out on this gathered community, I see so many of you who do this all the time. So this may just be a recommitment, sort of re-upping again to continue using your gifts in the way that you already do. Jenna, you could put up that next slide. Take a look at this graphic representation that might help us think about the connections between taking risks and growing. I assume that either in educational environments or work environments, many of you will be familiar with this kind of graphic. And if the font is too small, I'll tell you what it says. The innermost circle represents our comfort zone. That comfort zone re represents the range of activities and the spaces in life where we feel okay. We feel confident. This is the zone of familiarity. We can relax and breathe in the comfort zone. Now, there's nothing wrong with the comfort zone. I don't want you to get that. I fully plan to be in my comfort zone later today, uh, either playing pickleball or sitting in a chair reading or watching football or probably all three, okay? There's nothing wrong with that. It's good. You need comfort zone time as part of your life. The middle uh, ring, the middle circle is called, in this graphic, the learning zone. This is kind of the sweet spot where most growth for most of us usually happens, the learning zone, okay? And then the outer circle is the panic zone. That outer circle is not really an area for growth and development. That's a hyper-stressful environment in which we usually get overwhelmed, paralyzed, and stuck, okay? So what on earth does this graphic, thinking about comfort zone, learning zones, panic zones, what does that have to do with Commitment Sunday? with an invitation to, to pledge our finances to resource our shared ministries in the coming year? What does it have to do with God's call to grow towards a goodness that becomes more common, more shared? Well, I think it suggests what most of you already know intuitively. You're ahead of me here. Life works best when we live near the edge of our comfort zone. Kids, if you're taking notes, this is again on your sheet. Life works best when we live near the edge of our comfort zone. This is true for all of us personally, as you think about the different areas of your life. It's also true for us as a congregation. If we allow our anxiety to corral us into the safety always of what feels familiar, we, we will have to deal with the dangers of boredom and lethargy. That's what happens if you stay in your comfort zone too often or for too long. You will get bored. On the other hand, if we feel constantly pulled into experiences that are bewildering, challenges for which we feel ill-equipped into that outer circle, we will often feel panic and will tend to shut down. What we need is a communal way of life, a shared life, in which, as friends, we continue to invite one another to live near the edge of our comfort zone when we can, because that's when our life together becomes more contagious and the joy and the adventure of doing what we do, and you saw some images of that, of Be the Church Sunday last Sunday. All that sense of adventure and joy becomes more attractive to other people who say, I want a life lived on purpose, I want to be a part of a community like that. So just a couple of more questions as you continue reflecting on what you might put on that card. What would it look like for you, some of you are here as families, for your family, to respond faithfully to God's call to grow, to grow in this coming year. How might you use your time differently? What relationships might you invest in even more? What projects might you take up? What projects might you need to leave behind? And then shifting to think a little bit more about our congregational life together, what would it look like for us as Second Presbyterian, to live near the edge of our comfort zone? This is a question that our Matthew 25 group keeps alive all the time, but on our behalf. So we need to think about this together. Where might our attention shift as a congregation? What might we begin doing that we're not now? What risks might become imaginable and even attractive to us in that middle circle zone? Okay. You still have just a couple of minutes to decide what to put on that card. And for the next few minutes, I want to shift to talk about the fact that God has called us to grow together during a period of transition in this congregation's life. If you're a guest or if, you, if you're new, I want you to know that Second Prez is in a period of transition. 
As we move through, through a process towards calling our next pastor, my job as a transitional pastor is to facilitate that process. And I want to talk briefly about how we're planning to grow during this transitional phase of our life together. A few weeks ago, on October 9th, about 40 people participated in two different listening sessions. And then, in addition, we had several people who gave us feedback through an online form or who emailed us. Our session wanted to make sure that, as a congregation, we have multiple opportunities for input and feedback as we move through this transitional chapter of our lives. By the way, one of the upshots of that feedback is that we want to do more of that. Our session is convinced that, that, that large-scale buy-in and participation by the congregation all through this transition will be a bonus for us. The first question we asked was whether a couple of our strategic documents that we've produced tell the truth about who we are, where we are, where we're going. Do these documents adequately capture our evolving ministry and our identity here at Second as we navigate change? I'm going to quickly summarize some of the responses that we got. To this question, to put it simply, we got a mixed response. No one wanted to argue that these documents, the great report or some of the transitional updates, no one argued that they were misguided or misleading or just wrong, but neither did many people find them particularly helpful or compelling. As more than one person pointed out, the great report is nearly five years old as a strategic visioning document, and in a culture that moves as quickly as ours, five years is an awful long time. Moreover, the Great Report was a pre-pandemic document, and it's hard to avoid the conclusion that we need to think in fresh ways, given what we've all learned about ourselves during the pandemic. Most people resonated with the values and the goals laid out in the Great Report. Certain elements of that report seem more energizing than others. That's to be expected. I would name a few that, that came up as energizing repeatedly. Our commitment to diversity and inclusion, which you heard in Eva's uh, story today, our commitment to social justice, our commitment to our neighborhood and to relationships. Those things kept coming up again and again as yes, this is who we are, this is who we want to be, we've got to keep leveraging our energy into these values. Most people felt like these documents were an okay place to begin, but they felt more like the beginning of a conversation and certainly not the last word. Second continues to grow and evolve and new opportunities emerge and fresh passions will develop and we want to stay open to all of that. The second question we asked was much more simple because it was a yes, no question. Do you think we're ready to take the next step of forming a pastor nominating committee for fifth, sixth graders, if you're keeping track, the PNC, an acronym you will hear a lot over these next months, the PNC is a pastor nominating committee. Presbyterians love acronyms if you did not know that. It's a theological plan. So it was a yes-no question, and the feedback we got from the group was overwhelmingly, yes, we're ready to form the pastor nominating committee. We're ready to move forward. Based on that fact that most people said yes, your session is actively making plans to form the pastor nominating committee before the end of this year. So we are moving forward. I do want to be honest, though, and I want to point out that there were a couple of people who had hesitations about our readiness uh, to move forward. Both raised good questions about the process and the transition, One person felt like we haven't had time to fully reconnect and stabilize as a congregation following the disruption of the pandemic. Another person felt like we need some more time for healing. These are valid concerns. Session takes them seriously. So we're moving forward and we're making progress, but clearly we have identified some areas for continued attention and growth. The final question we ask invited reflection on what our pastor nominating committee ought to prioritize as we search for our next pastor. Now this question was kind of just, it opened the can. It elicited a wide range of responses on a variety of topics. We heard a a range of wise concerns about areas where we can improve as a church. Some of those concerns include pastoral care, fellowship opportunities, better balance between clergy and lay leadership, These aren't areas that we're going to wait around and put on the next pastor to fix when they get here, by the way. These are things that we can begin working on to to address now. What we heard in these responses was that your next person, pastor, needs to be a faithful, versatile, talented, personable generalist. 
Those are my words, right? Trying to sum up things. I'm trying to capture the plurality of concerns we heard when we asked what should be the priorities in the pastoral search. The pastor needs to be well-educated and relatable, theologically deep and personable. The pastor needs to be a skilled preacher and also committed to the, the maintenance of the building and its myriad systems. The pastor needs to be able to help attract young people and young families and make sure to include the older generations in any change that happens. We need a pastor, and now here I'm quoting from the spreadsheet that our volunteers put together, who is, quote, engaging, entrepreneurial, visionary, and skilled in operations, end quote. As your transitional pastor, part of me wants to say that I'm not sure that our Lord Jesus Christ would be able to land a job as your next pastor. But to be slightly less snarky about it, here's the truth. The truth is that you will call a pastor that has some of the important qualifications that you've deemed you need as a congregation, but not all of them, and that's okay. Because this is not a search for a pastor who will come in and fix everything, who has all the answers. This is a search for a leader who will partner with this congregation to unleash the gifts in this community for vibrant, shared ministry. And part of this transitional process involves a renewal of our trust in the Spirit's work in our midst. Of course, transitions make all of us anxious in different ways, and that's okay. But in that anxiousness, let's affirm in a fresh way our trust that the living Christ is here in our midst and has promised to equip us with all the gifts we need and the leaders we need to fulfill our calling as a congregation. So on this Commitment Sunday, I ask you to give generously as we grow into our shared calling. This transition time can be worrisome, but it can also be exciting. As we move into 2023, Second will be actively engaged in planning for our next chapter of life. And we're asking you to give financially to resource our ministries in the coming year. We're asking you to offer your gifts in service to other people. This is a calling to growth that has generosity woven all through it. We're growing personally and congregationally into a deeper commitment to our neighbors and our neighborhoods. We're loosening our grip on a vision of accruing resources for ourselves so that we can find a way of life framed by the commonwealth of community and congregation. And so, friends, may the living God fill our hearts and lives with infectious generosity. Amen.